cool. Robert, good to see you back to being the last person sitting down, man. It's good. You've you'd lost that privilege for a few days, a few Sundays, but <laughs> So Robert's the most social guy in the history of social people, so he's the last person because he's saying day to everyone in church. So, so good. Hey, um, kia ora, church. Hey, so this is Graham Carter, the magnificent Graham Carter. Um, so Graham was a missionary for, like, ever uh, in all the islands, setting up Christian radio stations, so everywhere from, you've been in all of them, really. Pretty much, yeah. Yep. It's pretty crazy. So Tonga, Fiji, Samoa, all of them, setting up Christian radio stations, which was, like, an amazing ministry, so, and, and they're all still, most of them are still going, eh? All of them? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Various cool. stages. Yeah, that's cool, eh? Mm. So pretty awesome. So yeah, Graham's been coming to church for a year and a half or more now. So pretty excited to have him um, bring the word this morning. So let me pray for you, bro. Yeah, okay. thanks, Craig. Yeah, cool. Let's pray together. Yeah. Yeah, Almighty God, we always hold your word um, like a treasure, eh, a taonga for us. Um, it's not just something that we read willy-nilly, eh? We want to read it. Uh, we want to obey it. We want to be changed by your word, the word of Almighty God. Um, so I just really lift up your servant, Graham, this morning, God. Thanks for the... The learning and the wisdom, the insight that you've given him over um, years and years. Um, yeah, we need good ears, God. We're we're really good at zoning out in sermons and worrying about the the planet and our lives and all sorts of crazy things. But we want to be diligent this morning and listening to what you have to say to us through your servant Graham. So help us to have good ears to hear you through him. Yeah, I pray you quicken his mind, give him good recall of all the things he studied and prepared and that you've laid on his heart. And then in, in for us, give us really good ears, uh, good souls to listen and absorb. So speak powerfully through Graham, we pray. Pray us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Ray. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. Thanks for that nice introduction. Um, yeah, it is true. I've been working throughout the islands since 1986, and mainly based in Tonga, but also uh, Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea, but also involved in setting up and, and getting... Christian radio started in the Solomon Islands, I'm sorry, in Samoa and Vanuatu as well. Um, so I've had an interesting life, but I'm not here to talk about my life. You know, I've been around for a while, and if you've been around like I have, although none of you have probably been as around for quite as long as I have, the longer you walk with the Lord, the more he becomes alive to you. And the scriptures, you know, I remember when I started reading the Bible, it was a duty. But as I began to see things with the eyes of faith, as God spoke to me from his word, even over one or two things, so my relationship with him grew. And it's like layers. And over the years, I've come to understand more and more of who he is and love him more and more because of it. And I'm sure many of you can testify to that same experience to some degree or another. Uh, there's what I want to share today has been on my heart for a couple of weeks and it's, it's probably not new to most of us. But like I've just been saying, with these verses that Harley Thank You read, they might be familiar to us, but for me lately it's really taken on a meaning that I hope to share in a way that brings hope to us because some of us today, we need hope. There is so much going down. And so many of us are affected directly. We need hope. And the scripture is interesting because it talks about hope, but it also talks about joy. And we look at our circumstances and we think, what planet are you from? How on earth can we find joy, let alone hope, in what I'm going through? Well, we can. God is faithful. This is the God that created the universe as well as you and I. This is the God that raised the dead. So he can change our hearts. And, and that's what I hope to bring to you a little bit today because some of us need it. And if we don't need it, we're going to one day because there's nothing surer about this life than it's full of hard times for us. Whether we're followers of Christ or not, we have to deal with hard times. As followers of Christ, and I'm assuming we are, we may not be, if you're not, Hopefully that what I share today will help you to understand why it's important. In fact, it's, it's life-changing to follow Christ. Jesus warned us in John 16, verse 33, that here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. 
Well, he doesn't really need to remind us today, does he? But the second part of this verse is incredible. But take heart, Jesus said, because I have overcome the world. Now, there's a choice right here. Where are we going to live? The choice comes down to do we actually literally take Jesus at his word or not? And this can be really hard to do because all around us, our circumstances, the, the, the sorrows and trials that we're going through scream at us relentlessly, even in our sleep. But somehow we've got to take on board the point that Jesus was making. And his point was this, that it doesn't matter how bad it is, what it is, how long it's going for. There's something greater he has for us. And it's because he has overcome the world. Elsewhere, he calls us overcomers. To overcome means to come above, to come over. I have to ask you, are you able to come above, come over your circumstances? All the discouragement, the disappointment, the fear, the anxiety, the stuff that's blasted at us through the media, the stuff that comes at us through our families, the news from the bank about interest rates. Are we able to come over that, to rise above that? Because that's what Jesus promises us. And that's the gospel. Now, I, I've talked to a lot of Christians in a lot of places over the years, and so many of us seem to assume the gospel is the day that I gave my life to the Lord. I believe the gospel, almost like that's a past tense thing, closed, done, finished. But the gospel, this is the gospel. This is the good news, the promises of God. And our job as believers are to take these, to become proactive in digging into these, so they become part of who we are more and more increasingly and the word in our life, the Holy Spirit in our life takes over so that we are, in fact, overcomers. And it's possible. And I want to talk a little bit more about that. And am I pressing the right button? Oh, can you... Um, I'm, I'm, yeah, that, that looks better. Do I really live? There's many verses, and this is what I mean about reading the Bible. At first we read, and these sort of come into our head. And we might think, oh, yeah, that's nice, but we don't apply it. We don't take it on board. You know, the Scripture says, and, and I'm using the old King James word because it has so much meaning. It says, reckon yourselves dead to sin and alive to Christ. That word reckon is an accounting term. It's where you take the value of something and you apply it. We've got to take the value of the word as we read it and apply it. We've got to stop and we've got to question God. We've got to talk to God and we've got to preach the word to ourselves. John 1.16 says, For his abundance, from his abundance we have all received. Gracious blessing, one after another. Now, do I live like that? Can I really say that my life reflects that? Am I walking in his blessing? He also said elsewhere that my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life, a life of abundance. Again, back to the King James, it talks about an abundance, abundant life. Now, the work I've done in the islands over the years, I've worked with people who have English as a second or even a third language. And a lot of people, especially in Tonga, where I've spent most of my time, they've grown up in the church, but they've never known the gospel. You ask the average Tongan what a gospel is, and he says, oh, I know, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's the gospel. But <clears throat> my point is here, that we've got to start living our life according to the abundance that God has given us. And that word abundant means beyond normal. And so when I've talked to people in the islands, I've always had to dig into what these words actually mean. Because one of the problems is we assume things. 
we read it, abundant is a, is a familiar word. A blessed life is familiar. We're always saying, oh, bless you this and bless you that. But do we stop and dig into it? And it's forced me to dig into these words. Abundant means beyond normal. It means without measure. And life, the word for life in the original Greek, and I'm not a Greek scholar, but I like to look up the words, is zoe, which means a quickened life. It's above normal. It's beyond our biology. <clears throat> now, my biology is my name, Graham Carter. It's my age, which I won't tell you. It's the fact that I'm right-handed. You know, it's the way I walk. It's the way I talk. It's the things I know. It's what I like to eat. That's my biology. And I can sit down and write a description of that. But Zoe is a different kind of life. It's the kind of life that Jesus promised us when he came. And when it talks about abundant life, he's talking about giving us Zoe that goes beyond the normal, beyond our biology and lasts forever. It's a spirit quickened life. Now I have to ask myself every day, am I living up to that? Am I laying hold of that and grasping that because every day the news media, the circumstances, the people around me are saying negative things which bring me to the world's level. It's a battle in the mind. And as the Apostle Paul called it, it's a mind of the flesh. And that's the old mind. That's the old way I used to live. That's the way we're raised. That's the way we're educated. We're educated to expect if you do well, you'll receive a reward. If you don't do well, you'll get punished. But that's not the way of the gospel. If we belong to God and claim him as our Lord and Saviour, then we have abundance. And yes, we go wrong. Yes, we do bad. But he grabs us and he pulls us back, back into that abundance. But we can't be like the blind horse, you know. We've got to look at where we're going if we're going to get there. And this is what eternal life is. This is what he promises us. And I pray that as we look at this a little bit further, it will give us the hope that we need. So how do we experience this in the light of our troubles? Oh, going the wrong way. That's the other scripture that Harley read to us from Matthew 11. It's to be yoked with Jesus. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. This is the very connection that he promises. Remember, connect up, connect in, connect out. And it's extremely counterintuitive how hard it is for me to put this deceitful old heart into subjection that Christ might rise. I must decrease that he must increase. And every day I've got to put myself in that place. And this is what it's about to be connected. I come into his word. I'm not just reading his word. I'm coming here for an appointment with Jesus. Jesus. And even when I'm reading in the Old Testament or, or, or wherever, there's something in there. There's always something. Lord, show me. Show me today from your word what I need, what I need to grow, what I need for the things that are coming at me today that I don't even know about yet. Lord, I need to draw my life from you, that abundant life that Jesus promised. If we approach him every day in the word like that, you'll be amazed at how things start to stand out to you and you can dig in. Lord, I've just seen this and I don't understand it. Help me to understand it. Lord, I've just seen this and I realise I don't measure up to that. Lord, I want to. Lord, I know once I get out there, I, I keep doing the opposite to what this says. So give me the desire. Lord, you're showing me, giving me the knowledge, but I need desire also. I want to desire this. Help me to remember, Holy Spirit, Bring this to my memory throughout the day so we can start working on this and my life can change and my life become more abundant. And this is how we connect with God. We preach this to ourselves every day. We meet him in here. It's not a dry read. It's not reading a book. This is the, the very life of God here laid out for us so in a supernatural way, the Holy Spirit can use it to change us, to give us that hope and that joy that we so desperately need. And that's what it means to be yoked. It does not mean our problems disappear. Remember Paul's thought in the flesh. He prayed and prayed, but it didn't disappear because God wanted his grace to be sufficient day by day, minute by minute. And it doesn't mean all either that he just blesses our plans 
And this for me has been a major, looking back, I've had to learn this over and over and over again. Oh God, thank you for your patience. You know, so often I've looked at this and I thought, oh, there's a good idea. That's how we can fix that. Let's do it. Oh, by the way, God, come and bless it. That's how I've lived so much. And I think you're probably a bit like that too. No, no, I've got to turn that over. I've got to start with his leading and his guiding. I've got to be prepared to let my plans be put aside because it comes back to faith and trust again. Do I trust him to be my heavenly father who loves me enough to give me the abundant life, that life above bio? Because really all I can recognise is the bio. And I don't want to live according to that. I want to do better. I want to do better in my life. So <clears throat> his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Now there's a scripture. I thought of it last night actually because when I came to Christ it was back in 1983 and I was going to a little church in Napier and we used to sing Isaiah um, 40, 31. I'm just going to turn to it. You might know it already, and I'll read it. Actually, no, this is the NLT. I'll quote it to you because I, I read it in the King James. They who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. And in our song, we, had, we added one more line to it. Teach me, Lord, teach me to wait. Now, there's the sermon right there. They who wait upon the Lord. Now, in my habit for explaining the Bible to people who are pretty well illiterate, I dug into what wait means because we assume we know what wait means. But in the Bible, you go back to the original Greek, and it does not mean to sit down and do some, do nothing. It's not like, oh, ho-hum, I'll just sit back and wait for God to do something for me. It's not that at all. It means to bind together, to entwine and bind together. And think about that. When you wait for a bus, you take the trouble to get yourself ready and get to the bus stop on time. So there's activity there. It's not passive. And I really woke up to this because I used to spend a lot of time with the king of Tonga back in the 80s, the old king in the 80s and 90s. And I used to visit him every time I was in Tonga and spend a couple of hours there. I'd take him books by Christian writers like John Stott and so on because I wanted to influence his thinking. And we used to talk about the Bible and, and, and so on. And I remember one day sitting there vividly and the old king was sitting in his big couch and I'm sitting across from him, and he's got a, a servant who's standing off to one side, just out of the king's line of sight, with folded arms, not saying a word, just watching the king. That's what a waiter is. He was waiting on the king. And one day, because the king was, he used to talk about other things, some of his trips were fascinating, and he'd talk about visiting a Chinese toothbrush factory and how they made their toothbrushes. And he just had a wealth of knowledge from all his travels. And one of the things about it is he could play the balalaika, which is a Russian stringed instrument. And all the weather ships that used to come into Tongan waters back in those days, the late 80s, early 90s, the Cold War, used to present him as a, with a balalaika as a gift. And one of the Russian um, sailors gave him a lesson on it, and he could play it. And he was telling me about this. And I said to him, well, your majesty, how many balalaikas do you have? And he said, 13. And as he said it, he just turned his head and glanced at his servant. And the servant scurried off without a word and got a balalaika and the king played me a little tune. That's what it is to wait on God. The servant didn't need instruction. He wasn't standing around on his phone and had to be yelled at to get his attention. He was waiting on his Lord, his King. And that's always formed a picture of me of Isaiah 40. They who wait upon the Lord, entwine yourself, pay attention, be concerned with what the Lord's concerned with, be desirous of being quick to serve him without him needing to instruct you. 
They who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. Well, last week, Craig told us about the teacher, the lawyer. Remember, as Hallie just read for us, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Elsewhere, it's called the greatest commandment. Now, why is it called the greatest? Now, this to me was a revelation, and it's a revelation that changed my life, and I pray that it brings hope to you who need it also, because I'd always taken this as a command, and it is a command. You shall love But it's a command that enables God to be glorified and to bless us. And, and I never really understood that until quite recently. The man wanted to justify his life that he thought was so perfect and he asked Jesus, who is my neighbour? And then Jesus told him the story of the Good Samaritan. But right at the end there, Jesus said, and here's the promise, do this and you shall live. It's that word again, that word for abundant life. It's the Zoe kind of life, the life beyond bio, the life that's eternal, full of glory, full of the Holy Spirit. Do this, and you shall have that kind of life. Awesome. God's command is also his promise. So we prove we love God by loving those close by. And and that's something as well that I wanted to highlight because so many people, and and I early on used to think, well, I love my wife, I love my children, I love my, you know, I love my work. In fact, I remember as an early Christian discussing this with somebody. Well, what's your priority of love? Oh, yeah, wife, kids, and it was a vertical hierarchy, but it's not that. It's not a vertical hierarchy. The word in the original just means close by. So it's whoever you're close by who needs love. That's who we love. But unfortunately, our circumstances and the problems that we face and have to deal with for so much of our time puts the blinkers on us and we miss seeing that. Now, I've got to be careful here because I know there's many people here in this church who are looking out for others. And I want to say well done because for two and a half years I was looking for a church home that displayed love and I found it here in Agora. I didn't find it in some other places. And so this is meant not to be a heavy word but to help us understand and to help us seek for more because the way we grow, the way we overcome our problems, and I don't mean that the thorn in our flesh will necessarily be removed, but I do mean that we'll live above them, overcome them, is by loving our neighbour. But so often, you know, because of the pressure, we think we're living for God, but we're not. We're no different to the world. And that's a question I want to ask you. If if you were to look hard at your life, does it look different to those who are in the world? I mean, it's easy. I, I deliver a bit of Uber food for my coffee money. And and I see beggars, you know, and, and there's an old lady sits outside Rose Plus and Ham East and I'll often arrange for them to give her some food. And, you know, I, we get these chances, we take them, but the world does the same. But Jesus isn't calling us to do the same as the world. He's calling us to come over, to live above and beyond the world. And this is it, our family. And this, the New Testament so often refers to love in terms of our brothers and sisters much more often than loving the world. 
And so this is where it begins. And my plea for those of us who are not going through it at the moment is to be like that king's servant, to be aware, to be proactive, to be looking, to look for the faces that are downcast, to look for the people who are not there but usually are, and not to be afraid to go up to them because we just may be part of Jesus being equally yoked to them to help them get through the situation that they're facing. See, he isn't here anymore. He's gone. But he sent his spirit who lives in us. And so we become his hands and his feet. And so this is the message of love your neighbor. Because remember the two promises. If we're equally yoked with Jesus and serving others, what did he promise? Rest for our souls. He also promised, do this, love your neighbor, do this, and you shall live. Now, my heart being what it is, I've got to preach this to myself every morning. I've been through some hard times over the last few years, and so I warn you, if you've not been through hard times, I mean really hard times, you're very likely to. And so be prepared, get to know the word, preach it to yourself and trust the Lord to change you day by day, step by step. And you'll have joy. One of the most joyful, happiest people I know, and I remember her fondly, was an old lady in her 80s back in Napier when I came to Christ. Her name was Hessel. And she was a character. She was a rough diamond. She'd lived all her life and came to Christ not long before I did. But she was a little wee short thing, all stooped out over. She used to drive to church and goodness knows how dangerous that was and she, she had a, a terrible voice and sometimes she'd call out to the pastor during the service and she had a voice like a circular saw hitting a nail <laughs> but she had a heart of gold and she used to sit there with a notebook in church and she'd take it and she'd take notes of what the pastor was saying, but she'd also talk to people and she'd take notes because she had a bad memory. And she was my praying grandmother. That's what I used to call her because she would pray for me all the time. Not only me, others as well. And I, after I left Napier and moved to Auckland, I'd go back and visit Napier, but there was always a place to stay at Hessel's. And she'd pull out her notebooks and she had a whole lot of these, you know, the small school exercise books. And she'd pull them out and she'd look back. Oh, how did, how did this go? You said back last September that you were facing this. She'd written it down. She'd been praying for me. What a wonderful woman she was, but she was always joyful. She didn't have a lot in her life to be joyful about. Her husband had died. She was on her own. She wasn't well. She loved the church. She loved the people. And it showed what an encouragement she was. Hessel. I long to be like her as I grow older. If I'm not able to do anything, I want to be able to smile for people and approach them and help them and just be cheerful for them is enough. Hessel couldn't do anything physically, but she could be cheerful. So it starts by being intentional, by preaching to ourselves, by looking for opportunities, by meeting little practical needs. There's plenty in Agora who need it. And let me say, even though this is a church of love, we always need more. Don't preach to people. Be a hessel. Just come up alongside and say, oh, hi, I haven't haven't met you here before. Have you been here before? Or say, oh, hi, how are things going for you? How's your week been? You know, don't preach to them. Don't tell them, oh, well, all things work together for good. That's not what people need. But sometimes, well, let me tell you, Back in 2009, in Tonga, had a team from Las Vegas there. Now, Las Vegas is probably as far from Tonga as you can get socially. Eight people. They'd come uh, nurses, because we work with disabled people there as well. Nurses and a couple of builders and a lawyer. Don't know what use the lawyer was going to be in Tonga. But he came along willing to help. And they were in Tonga doing their thing. And then 
August, I forget, the 8th, I think it was, about 11.30 p.m. at night, a Mayday call came through from the Princess Ashika, which was a Tongan ferry. Had 276 people on board. It sank without notice, 85 kilometres from shore. And the people didn't know for two days what had happened. The, the people just knew their family members were missing at sea. I'll never forget it, but they started gathering at the wharf, the families, to wait news of the Princess Ashika and the people on board her. And the police, the Tongan police, put a cordon out to stop people going in unless they were family members. I had two leaders in Tonga, one's a Fijian, the other was a Tongan, the Fijian leader drove the van straight down there to the wharf. And, of course, the police said, well, no, if you're not a family member, you can't go on. But some of the families on there recognised the van and recognised Willie and called him in and said to the police, you've got to let him in, let him in. So Willie, being really wise, he went back and he got the team and he rounded up a couple of our radio hosts and people that he could at short notice and he took a van full. Now, these Americans went down to the wharf. Two builders, three nurses, one lawyer, I forget what the other one was. No language. Just ordinary people from their church. What are they going to do? They went and just sat down and they hugged and cried. Excuse me if I get emotional because I knew some of the families too who lost loved ones on that ferry. When the news came, they'd found five survivors. One of them was the captain. And there were funerals and all of this and we were just heavily involved just to be there, just to be the presence. And, you know, afterwards... Afterwards, we had like a revival breakout in Tonga. And, and I think there were several reasons, but I think the Ashika was one of them. These people wanted us to be there, even though we were foreigners. And they wanted the Tongans that they heard on the radio, who were just young people, sharing their personal walk with Jesus in a country where everybody goes to church. But like I say, the gospel is just Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. For days afterwards, we had people phoning the station, people visiting the station, and then it started to take off on, on a revival that lasted for a few weeks and actually made it into the newspapers around the Pacific. But I'm not, I'm not here to talk about that. But what am I talking about? What I'm saying is God works through you and I. And, and this, is, this is the blessing this is the blessing of being equally yoked with Jesus. It's rest for our souls, but it's for a purpose, that we might serve one another, especially here in the household of God. And God will use that. He'll use it beyond your wildest expectation. I mean, these people, I've kept in touch with them because I used to go back to that church regularly, several times a year. And <clears throat> two of those nurses serve overseas as medical missionaries. Isn't that amazing? One of the builders has got a couple of mates in another church, three of them, and every year they set a budget, they pray, and they talk to churches, and they grab another three men from different churches, build their, get their budget, and they go down to South America, to Ecuador usually, on building projects. You see, it's changed their lives. Now, I'm not saying we're all going to become missionaries and go to Ecuador and building projects, but what I'm saying is this life with Jesus is an abundant life. It's a spirit-filled life. It's beyond what we can do and expect with our biology. You just don't know where God will take you until you start walking. And it all begins with connection. Connection. I went, oh, I think it was probably three weeks after the Ashika sank, 
and I went and visited the captain. And um, I don't know how much you know about shame-based cultures. He survived. He had survivor's guilt. He didn't want to survive. And the people, even the neighbours, well, fear and grief brings anger, doesn't it? And who do you direct it at? Him, the captain. Because he was blamed and there was a court of inquiry. But what the inquiry revealed was the fact that this young man and his family had spent a fortune on him getting his ticket so he could be the captain. So he had all that family expectation on him. He heard from the director of the port of Napier that the ferry was unsafe. It was only two weeks old in Tonga. It had just been bought. And the director of the port said it was unsafe and he wrote to the prime minister. And when the captain heard this, he didn't want to take it to sea. But they put pressure on him. You want to keep your job? You want to keep earning income for your family? You do it. You do what we say. And so he took it to sea and it sank. I'll, I'll never forget sitting in his home, across the table from him, thinking, what do I say? I held his hands. His wife was sitting next to him. Willie and his wife were sitting next to me. I just held his hands. And I said, I have no idea what you're feeling. I've never experienced this. But Jesus has. And we talked about Jesus and about his love and about how he went to the cross to bear our shame. He made a commitment for Christ, that man, and his wife. And then some weeks later, we started a Bible study in his home. But that's why I want to tell you that this life is not meant to be lived under the circumstances. It's meant to be coming over. So whatever you're facing, take heart, take courage. Start with being connected with God because Frankton, Hamilton, New Zealand needs to see the glory of God. And this is how they see it, through us. By this shall all men know, Jesus said, that you are my disciples. You see, let's pray that we find our place and play our part to the full in making Agora a beacon of light here in Frankton. We've got the thunder thingy coming up. You know, there's other opportunities, plenty of opportunities, but the people of this country need the light of the gospel. They're drowning under despair, under discouragement, under fear, under anxiety, and we have the way out. But we can only help them if we're helping ourselves to live abundantly and helping our brothers and sisters to live abundantly too. So let me pray just as I close. We haven't had a discussion, but really I don't... I thought about a discussion, but really I just want you to think about your own life. Is it... If I was to look at your life, would I see it as different to everybody else who's struggling? I don't mean to be condemning when I say that, but I do mean to lift your eyes to see God. You know, Jesus, when he taught us to pray, he didn't start with our problems who are here on the earth. He started with our Father who art in heaven, and that's our perspective. We start with God, who he is, what he's promised, what he will do. And Father, we do we just look to you now and we lift your name high and we ask you to come into our lives in a fresh and new way and revive us, O oh Lord. Lord, some of us need hope beyond description. We need hope because we're facing such enormous problems. But Lord, you have promised that you have overcome the world and we just want to be a part of that overcoming for ourselves, for our brothers and sisters here, and for our community. 
So Lord, help us to be yoked with you, to realize that every step we take, we can take it with you, that you will bear our burdens if we will wait upon you, that you will take us, Lord, places far beyond we could ever ask and think. And our desire is to be taken to those places, Lord, that our lives while we live in this short vapor that we're living in may glorify you and we may enjoy that abundant life forever, forever in heaven with you. Oh, Father, revive us, I pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen.